Hello everybody. We are going to talk about seismic hazard analysis for these next two lectures. Uh, in this first part of the lecture we're going to review a little bit about uh, what a deterministic seismic hazard analysis is. We're going to review a little bit about probability theory and, and discuss and introduce the idea of a probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. Then we'll begin to um, show how the various uncertainties in earthquake prediction are accounted for in a probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. Now in the second lecture, part two of this lecture, we're going to continue with the various uncertainties from a PSHA and then show how everything ties together and how we can uh, use then seismic hazard curves to obtain ground motions corresponding to return periods or um, likelihoods of interest. So when I say seismic hazard analysis, what I'm talking about is the application of attenuation relationships to predict ground motions for a particular site. That's really all a seismic hazard analysis is. So when we say the process of predicting strong ground, strong ground motions for a given site, that's what a seismic hazard analysis is. As I mentioned before, we're going to discuss two types of seismic hazard analysis. Uh, deterministic, or what we call DSHA, and probabilistic, or what many of us call PSHA. There's other types of seismic hazard analysis, such as physics-based seismic hazard analysis. We're not going to talk about that in this class, but, but um, just be aware that they're out there. So when I say deterministic seismic, seismic hazard analysis, or DSHA, it's what I kind of refer to as the original seismic hazard analysis. What I mean by original is we've been doing DSHA for decades. Um, and, and it's the process that really is kind of intuitive and common sense. Um, in, in essence, what we do with the DSHA is we represent a single scenario earthquake. And um, the idea with the scenario earthquake is we're trying to be conservative. So in other words, there's lots of assumptions that we need to make regarding a, a scenario earthquake. How big is it going to be? Where is it going to occur? Uh, just for example, in all of these different scenarios, we have to make assumptions. So typically we're going to assume assumptions that are going to give us larger ground motions. So that's what I mean by these uh, being conservative. The steps to a deterministic seismic hazard analysis are, are first we need to identify all of the active sources and magnitudes. Now, um, when I have something in parentheses, that means I'm being a little sarcastic or, or tongue-in-cheek. Because how in the world do we define what an active seismic source is? Um, typically, it's we, we say, well, it's active if the seismic source has moved in the last 10,000 years or 100,000 years or million years. But, but you know, really who makes that decision or who draws that line in the sand? And, and that's a really challenging question. So lots of times, um, depending on the importance of what are, whatever it is that we're designing, that's going to affect what we call uh, an active source. And then, of course, as we discussed um, in earlier lectures, we would use equations like the Wells and Coppersmith equation to predict magnitudes for each one of those sources. The next step is once we have all of our sources defined, is we're going to compute the closest source to site distance for each of those uh, sources. So maybe the best thing I can do um, is pull up, well, let's see. I apologize. I had to um, pause for a minute because my uh, clicker wasn't working here. So uh, what I wanted to do is pull up my whiteboard. There we go. Okay. So um, I want to demonstrate. I have a site. It's located right here. And let's say I have a couple of different seismic sources, uh, potential faults located around my site. So step one says identify the sources. So, uh, you know, I essentially did that. I have a source here, 
I have a source here and I have a source here. And I would, of course, assign uh, a magnitude to each one. So that might be, you know, magnitude 6.2. And maybe this one is a magnitude 5.9. And maybe this one's a magnitude, uh, I don't know, 7.0 or something like that. So then the next step is I'm going to compute the closest source to site distance. So I'm going to find what the closest source to site distance is uh, from my site to each of these sources. And it's usually going to be um, the source to site distance that forms a, a 90 degree angle from my source. Um, but sometimes I'm not going to be able to do that. Anyway, once I find that sor uh, closest source to site distance, that's typically going to be the distance in an attenuation relationship that's going to give me the largest predicted ground motion. Then I'm going to use my attenuation relationships to compute the ground motion. So that's where, again, um, you'll recall I have um, maybe PGA you know, versus source to site distance, and I have all my points. And I have my prediction equation that looks like that. Uh, this is where I'm going to go up for um, if that's, you know, R1 and that's R2 and that's R3. You know, for maybe uh, R2 might be this guy right here. R1 might be this guy right here. R3 might be this guy right here. And I'm just going to get the corresponding... PGAs for each one of those distances. Um, and so, you know, shown here, this would be, of course, the 50th percentile. Maybe I'd want to use, you know, the 84th percentile or something like that. But the point is, uh, you know, I have to use an attenuation relationship to predict that ground motion. And then finally, I'm going to identify the governing ground motions. Um, meaning uh, usually the largest ground motion. So in this particular case, I would say, well, you know, this guy right there is the largest ground motion if I was using the 50th percentile, or if I was using the 84th percentile, it would be this guy right there would be my largest ground motion. And that corresponds to R2. So that would be, you know, this fault right there. That's my governing fault. That's my governing earthquake. And that's what I'm going to design for, for my structure. So this PGA then that I would get would be the PGA from my DSHA. Now there's a couple of, well, there's several problems with the DSHA approach. But there's two problems that are pretty big and that are hard to overcome. The first problem is that the DSHA doesn't explicitly deal with uncertainty. So there's lots of uncertainty along the way. For instance, I had to make um, an assumption regarding the magnitude of the fault. Could, could the seismic source have produced a lower magnitude? Well, sure. Did I account for that? Nope. Could, uh, even with a known magnitude, could I have experienced maybe the, I don't know, the 16th percentile ground motion? Yeah. Did I account for that? Nope. And, and so DSHA does not necessarily account for uncertainty. Um, often we can bump up and look at higher percentiles when we look at magnitude or predicted ground motions from the attenuation relationships, but rarely do we account for the, the possibility of lower ground motions or lower magnitudes. The second problem is that uh, DSHAs only deal in the realm of possibility, but they never really deal with likelihood. And this is a big deal. Um, and, and I'll give you an example. You know, consider if we were performing a DSHA for some um, building, and we were trying to choose between San Francisco or Memphis, Tennessee. Now, both of these locations have experienced magnitude 8.0 or greater earthquakes. And in recent history, in the last uh, 200 years or so. But, you know, it, so does that mean that if I was to design this building for both locations, that 
the building would have to be designed to the exact same seismic criteria in San Francisco or Memphis? Let me frame the question another way. If I were to ask you which location, San Francisco or Memphis, has the higher seismic hazard, what would you say? Almost every one of you would almost instinctively say San Francisco. And my answer or my question is why? Because uh, Memphis has experienced very large earthquakes too. What is it about San Francisco that makes you automatically want to choose it as the higher seismic hazard? Well, it boils down to likelihood. If the lifespan of the building is 50 or 100 years, which location is it more likely to be hit by the next earthquake? San Francisco or Memphis? San Francisco, obviously, because they have a, it has a lot more active faults uh, in San Francisco. So if, if that's the case, how do we account for that likelihood in a DSHA? The short answer is we, we typically don't. And so that's a problem. And that leads us to introduce the topic of probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. So PSHA was um, initiated in the 1960s and was developed and refined in the 1970s and 1980s as a means for accounting for uh, the most significant uncertainties associated with future earthquake events and, and trying to predict ground motions from those events. So the cool thing about PSHA is rather than running away from uncertainty or trying to deal with it by uh, just using really conservative assumptions in every single step in the process, the PSHA acknowledges that we have uncertainty and it tries to quantify it. So what are the different uncertainties that we deal with in seismic hazard analysis? Well, maybe it's we don't know where exactly the earthquake will occur. We have multiple seismic sources that the earthquake can occur on, and we have multiple locations on those seismic sources where the earthquake can occur. We don't know how big the earthquake will be. Even if we knew where it was going to occur, we may not know what its magnitude is going to be. And even if we knew where the earthquake was going to occur and how big it was going to be, we don't know the intensity of the ground motion at our site. Remember that attenuation relationships are developed from known earthquakes, and there's still a ton of scatter in the ground motions. And so um, even with known earthquakes, we can't predict what the ground motions are going to be uh, precisely. And we don't know exactly when the earthquake is going to occur. And so, you know, these four uncertainties are, are huge. And, and it may cause you to sit and wonder, well, what do we know? You know, if, if I'm trying to predict what a future earthquake is, how in the world are we going to do that with all of these uncertainties? Before I get to that, though, it's important that we understand a little bit about probability theory. Now, PSHA is going to deal with all of these uncertainties simultaneously, and it's going to do it using what's called the total probability theorem. Now, uh, this is a very famous theorem and, and equation in the probability world, and, and it's a way that we can um, compute conditional probabilities. Or, or when I say that, I mean the probability of something occurring given that something else occurs. And so what we're going to do is we're going to um, sum the probability of the system um, by summing the probabilities of each little individual uh, contributing part. Let's review a little bit of the nomenclature that we're going to have to know if we deal with probability theory. First of all, if I want to know the probability of A, I can express it like this, where we have P bracket of A. That means probability of A. Now if I see P bracket A with this uh, vertical line right there, that vertical line means given. So this is the probability of A given that B occurs. 
Uh, so if I want to know the probability that a equals little a given b equals little b, it would be written like this. A couple other things we need to know. If we want to uh, represent the mean, uh, I can write it like this. So this mean right here represents the population. Or in other words, uh, if, if I could magically collect data from every possible earthquake that occurs, um, then that would represent the population. If I'm just collecting data from a sample or a subset of the population, then I would represent the mean this way. And standard deviation, which represents the spread of the data, uh, is, is represented this way. So sigma would be the standard deviation of the population, or in the case of earthquakes, every uh, earthquake that's occurred. Or, or S represents the standard deviation of a subset of earthquakes that have occurred. So when I talk about the total probability theorem, I'll, I'll just introduce you first to the mathematical equation where it says that the probability of y is equal to the summation of the probability of y given um, some x value times the probability that that x value is going to occur. And given every single input or x value, um, we're going to go ahead and sum it, uh, sum across all those different x values, those probabilities. I mean, that's it. That's the total probability theorem. But what does this really mean in terms of, of you know, a real world example? Whenever we deal with probabilities, I think one of the best examples that we could use is the example of baseball. So let's give an example there. Now, I, I got to give you some warning. I developed this example uh, around the year 2012, and so uh, players have probably been traded and moved from team to team. So the example I'm giving you here is uh, based on players and their 2012 baseball team. So have uh, a little bit of mercy on me uh, because I know that some of these players have likely been traded. But back in 2012, the Philadelphia Phillies were a pretty good baseball team. And um, they have a batter that, that uh, was named Ryan Howard, and he was a really good uh, baseball batter. Now, let's just pretend, I've made these numbers up. They're not real. I don't want anyone going out to Vegas and trying to make some money on these numbers. I've, I've just made them up. But let's say that the, the Phillies winning record and Ryan Howard's results at his first at-bat in a game are correlated. Let's suppose um, that the data, or the history has shown that if he hits a single, the Phillies have a 50% chance of winning that baseball game. If Ryan Howard hits a double at his first at bat, let's say they have a 60% chance of winning the baseball game. If Ryan Howard hits a triple, let's say it's a 70% chance of winning. And if Ryan Howard hits a home run, let's say historically the Phillies have won 90% of those games. If he strikes out, they only have a 25% chance of winning. And if he walks, let's say historically they've had a 50% chance of winning. Pretty good for made up numbers. Now, let's say that tonight the Phillies are playing the Red Sox. Now back in 2012, the Red Sox had a really good pitcher named John Lester. Now let's say that the statistical or the historical numbers of um, Ryan Howard facing John Lester has been the following at his first at bat. Um, when he's faced John Lester, let's say he struck out 20% of the time. Let's say he walked 20% of the time. Let's say he got a single 30% of the time, a double 15% of the time, a triple 10% of the time, and a home run 5% of the time. Now you baseball aficionados, I know you're looking at that going, oh, those are incredible percentages. Yeah, I know. Again, I'm just making this up. It's, it's an example, okay? All right, so here we go. Let, let's say that I want to know the probability that the Philadelphia Phillies are going to win the baseball game tonight against the Red Sox given uh, 
Ryan Howard's correlation as first at bat versus John Lester. So here we go. Using the total probability theorem, the probability that they're going to win is going to be equal to the probability that Ryan Howard will strike out at his first at bat times the probability uh, that he strikes out. Plus the probability of them winning given he walks times the probability that he walks. Plus the probability that he wins given a single times the probability he hits a single. Plus the probability of a win given he hits a double times the probability that he hits a double against John Lester. Plus the probability of a win given he hits a triple times the probability he hits a triple against John Lester. Plus the probability they win given he hits a home run times the probability that he hits a home run against John Lester. So all we're going to do is plug and chug. The probability that he, uh, the Phillies win given he strikes out is 25%. And the probability that he strikes out against John Lester in our example is 20%. And all we're going to do then is we're going to fill in all these different probabilities, multiply them, and sum them up <clears throat> so that we um, come out with a probability of a win is 50.5%. So, uh, you know, this is what, what the, the guys in Vegas do when they make the odds in any sporting event is they're trying to play the probabilities and the numbers. They're using the total probability theorem to... Um, come up with probabilities of things that they want. So um, a couple of other things that we need to know about probability theory. How do we compute individual probabilities? So for instance, the probability of a strikeout or the probability of a walk, those kinds of things. Uh, we're going to use what are called probability density functions. Um, and I want to introduce three main types of uh, PDFs or probability density functions that uh, PDF is what these things are called that we use regularly in earthquake engineering. So this is a uniform probability distribution, a normal probability distribution, and a log normal probability distribution. The uniform probability distribution is what we use um, to describe the likelihood of something occurring that, that we really know nothing about. We may know, for instance, what the minimum possible value might be, and we may know what the maximum possible value might be, but anything in between the minimum and the maximum, we really have no clue. So we're just going to assign anything in between those to have the same likelihood. And anything that's to uh, the left or less than the minimum, or anything that's to the right or greater than the maximum, we're going to say has no probability of occurring. So this is a uniform probability function. One of the most well-known and widely used probability density functions is a normal probability function, or sometimes called a Gaussian uh, function or a bell curve. It has lots of different names. And it looks something like this where um, the mean corresponds to the peak of uh, our curve and the standard deviation describes the spread or how wide the curve is. And we can compute uh, this probability density function using this equation right here. So how you use these curves, say I have a given input, say x1, I want to know what the probability of x equals x1 is. So I go to x1 on my probability density function, come over, and that right there is my probability that x equals x1. That's how you know, these curves work. The log normal probability density function um, is the same as a normal density function, but it works when um, we have a log normal scale of x. So for instance, this is a linear scale of x, but if this was a log normal scale of x and we transformed the x-axis, we would get a nice looking bell curve on the log normal scale. Um, so a lot of things in the real world 
a lot of types of data tend to follow this log normal distribution where they kind of stack on the low end or the high end and then you kind of get a long tail um, going the other direction. Now, if we were interested in, uh, for instance, the probability of x being less than x1, for instance, not necessarily that, that x equals x1. I, I don't care about that. I want the probability that x is less than x1. Then I'm going to use what's called a cumulative density function, or a CDF. All this is, is the integral of the PDF. So I'm going to integrate the PDF. So if I plot it, um, I go from a zero, a value of 0% all the way up to a value of 100% or 1. And of course, um, at the center, where my x value is equal to the mean, I get a probability of 50%. So uh, again, the CDF is just the integral of the probability density function. And uh, if I wanted the probability that of x being greater than x1, then what I have to do is do 1 minus the cumulative density function of x. OK. We do a lot of probability of exceedance stuff in earthquake design. You know, for instance, what's the probability that my ground motion will exceed some tolerable ground motion? What's the probability that my ground displacement will exceed some allowable ground displacement? Uh, another way that we can write the cumulative density, density function is using this capital phi here. Um, it, this represents the standard normal cumulative density function. And of course, um, its input is the z value, where we just take the difference between our value of interest and the mean from our distribution and, and normalize it by the standard deviation. OK, so let's talk about our first uncertainty that a PSHA is going to deal with. The first uncertainty is we don't know where the earthquake will occur. We call this type of uncertainty spatial uncertainty. And um, we account for it by uh, assuming that the earthquake can occur in various places and then assigning a probability that the earthquake will occur in that place. Now, typically, we're going to assume that the earthquake has the same or uniform likelihood of occurring in every possible location along a seismic source. And so we're going to uh, use a uniform probability distribution with uh, these various seismic sources. The seismic sources could range between like a point source, so that might be like a volcano, where if that's the case, our probability is associated with one distance, this, um, this R sub S. It might be a fault or a line source. So in this case, you know, we have a minimum distance from our site to the source. And we also have a maximum distance. And our probability density function is going to range between our minimum and our maximum. Anything to the left of the minimum and anything to the right of the maximum is going to be equal to zero. And then we can also have things like an area source where we don't really know where the fault is located. So we're just going to assume that the fault can occur anywhere in this gridded area. And so we're going to you know, look at the probability that the distance could be to any one of these squares. And then we're going to sum up the probabilities. I mean, you get the idea of what I'm doing, right? We're going to sum those probabilities up, and we're going to get some sort of um, probability distribution. And we're still going to have an R min here. And we're still going to have an R max. And all the probability is going to be between the minimum and the maximum distance. So now 
Like I said before, we typically assume a uniform probability density function when it comes to spatial uncertainty. Uh, unless, of course, we have um, site-specific uh, paleoseismic data that suggests otherwise. So here are the steps of uh, accounting for spatial variability in a PSHA. First thing we're going to do is we're going to identify the closest and the farthest possible distances from our site to the source and then we're going to compute the difference between them and we're going to uh, call that distance D. Now the next thing we're going to do is we have to define bins for our PDF. What I mean by bins? Um, well these are bins. You see how they're columns and they have a, a discrete distance associated with each column? That's a bin. So we got to select the desired number of columns or bins that are going to be in our probability density function. And so we can compute the bin size as simply the D that we computed up here divided by the number of bins that we want. So once we compute that bin size, then we're going to go to the seismic source and we're going to divide the seismic source up into sub-segments. It could be any number of sub-segments that we want. And then what we're going to do is we're going to compute the distance from our site to the center of each sub-segment. And then whatever distance we get, we're going to assign it to the appropriate bin um, that was characterized in step number two. Then in step number five, we're going to tally the number of sub-segments that are in each bin. And we're going to divide that number by the total number of sub-segments to get the probability for that bin. Then we're going to plot each bin probability as a function of distance, and that will develop our PDF. So I know that these steps seem a little abstract. Let's just do an example. Let's say I have a 100 kilometer long fault. And here's my site, and it's located 10 kilometers away from the fault perpendicularly, and then 10 kilometers in from the end of the fault. So according to step number one, I need to compute my minimum and my maximum distance. So you can imagine that my minimum distance is just 10 kilometers. That's going to be this distance right here. My maximum distance is going to be the distance from my site clear out to the end of the fault. So if, if that's the case, then I know that uh, this segment right here is going to be 100 minus 10, or that's going to be 90 kilometers. And we know that this segment, the vertical segment of my triangle is 10 kilometers. So I can use Pythagorean's theorem to solve what the hypotenuse is, and I get 90.55 kilometers for um, my source to site distance. Okay? So then I compute D, which is the difference between my R max and my R min, and I get 80.55 kilometers. Then for my next step, I would need to compute how many distance bins I want to be in my PDF. So um, in this instance, let's say I want four distance bins in my PDF. So my bin size is going to be D, that's 80.55, divided by my number of desired bins. It's four. So I get 20.137 kilometers per bin of width. In step number three, then, I need to divide my fault into five subsegments. Why five? Well, I just chose five. Um, you, you can divide it into as many subsegments as you want. You can divide it into a hundred subsegments if you wanted to. I just chose five because it's easy to show for this example. So if I have a hundred kilometer long fault divided into sub or five subsegments, each subsegment is going to be 20 kilometers long. Then I'm going to compute the distance from my site to the midpoint of each of these subsegments, and and that's what each of these numbers here represents. Okay. So once then I have those uh, distances, I'm going to start placing them into bins. So bin number one is um, 
my source to site distance of 10 to 30.137 kilometers. Bid number two is 30 to you know, a little over 50 kilometers. Bid number three is a little over 50 to a little over 70 kilometers and a little over 70 to 90.55 kilometers. Okay, so um, let's, you know, let's go ahead and divide this up. Uh, where does 10 kilometers fall? Well, it falls in bin number one. What about 22.36 kilometers? Let's see. That should also fall in bin number one. I, I'm looking at this and I think I have a typo or a mistake in here. 40.23 kilometers should fall into uh, bin number two. 60. 0.83 kilometers should fall into bin number three and 80.62 kilometers should fall into bin number four okay so if I tally these up um, that should actually be one and this here should actually be two so if I tally then up these probabilities so if I take uh, all together I have five so if I take 2 divided by 5, I get 20%. If I take 1 divided by 5, I get, um, oh, I'm sorry, if I take 2 divided by 5, I get 40%. If I take 1 divided by 5, that's 20%. 1 divided by 5, 20%. 1 divided by 5, that's 20%. So that's uh, that should be 40% because of my typo. And that should be 20%. Should be two. And that should just be one. So that's how that example works. Um, so anyway, um, what we're going to do is this will be the end of this part one lecture. I hope from this example you you observed um, how we can account for spatial variability on a fault. In the next lecture, we're going to go jump right into how we account for how large an earthquake will be and the other uncertainties associated uh, and accounted for in a probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. So um, go ahead and, and you can finish this lecture, stand up, stretch your legs, and then we're going to jump into lecture number two. Thanks.